uh, announcement this morning. Um, I am not Neil Tomba. In case you're wondering, you get the younger, chubbier version of him today. <laughs> and so, uh, very excited to be with you today. And, um, you know, though, I do want us to take a moment and just make sure that we are, in fact, praying uh, for Neil and Vila and a handful of other people from our church who are actually in Cuba right now. Uh, and they are ministering to um, our partners, who we've been in a long-time partnership with. And, um, but also pray for Cuba. Um, some of you may have read in the news earlier this week that there was a large explosion at a hotel. Um, in downtown Havana, which killed a number of different people. What a lot of people don't know is that the denomination that we work with, primarily down in Cuba, their national headquarters is actually attached to that hotel. Uh, and so there's a big church there that has been running services since like 1880. Uh, and that church, the roof collapsed, and there's just a whole bunch of damage there. And praise the Lord, nobody in the church was hurt or killed when the explosion happened. Uh, but we should be praying for our brothers because restoring a damaged building in Cuba is not an easy uh, task. And so let's be praying for them. Pray for Pastor Neil and the team that's there just ministering to them during this time of, of crisis and challenge. Uh, so would encourage you and, and uh, thank you for doing that. But as we get into today, what I'd like you to do for a moment is um, imagine with me. I've got kind of a vivid imagination, so, so, so go with me here. Imagine a young man sitting on a couch. And this young man is surrounded by 15 to 20 of his closest family and friends. Now, he's playing it cool, but his family knows he is going through a roller coaster of emotions. Anticipation, excitement, worry, anxiety, and maybe just a little bit of fear. Because they know in this moment, in this time, this man's life is about to change. It has been a long road, full of a lot of pain, injury, cold, heat, success, failure, and it's about to all be worth it for this young man and his family. And then suddenly it happens. A voice rings out announcing the change of this young man's life as somebody says, with the first pick, in the 2022 NFL Draft, the Jacksonville Jaguars select Trayvon Walker, linebacker, Georgia. Now, for Trayvon and the other 261 young men who were selected in this year's NFL Draft, their life is, is now different forever. Because from that moment forward, regardless of what happens, whether they're stars in the NFL or they flame out in training camp, whether they have a long career or short career, they make millions of dollars or don't make millions of dollars, forever, these young men will be able to say, on that day, I was picked. I was selected. I was chosen. And the question I think we could ask ourselves is, what causes the 32 NFL teams to pick the people that they pick? I mean, there's thousands of college football players. What makes them select these particular people to join their team? And what you find is these, these NFL teams have spent countless hours debating and arguing and planning for what are the qualities in the players that we are looking for that are going to help us accomplish our goal, hoisting the Lombardi, Lombardi Trophy in victory in a Super Bowl. And so what they do is they develop these qualities. So what are some of the qualities? Well, for instance, um, size. You know, offensive linemen should weigh at least a certain amount. Uh, quarterback should be at least a certain height. Defensive linemen should have arms that are a certain length. The quarterback should have certain size hands, apparently. It's strength. How many reps can they do on the bench press? How high can they jump? It's speed. A wide receiver has to be at least this fast to even be considered to be drafted. It's intelligence. NFL playbooks are thick, and every play, everyone has a different job to do. And so can these guys absorb the plays and know exactly what to do in the right moment in order to win? It's character. Are they going to be good teammates or are they going to be a locker room cancer? Are they going to be uh, a great PR opportunity for the team or are they going to bring shame on the team because of their off-field behavior? It's decision-making. Can they make the necessary decisions in the split second that can be the difference between winning and losing? And so what they do is they poke and they prod and they evaluate these thousands of college football players and when they find one that lines up with the qualities that they prefer, they run to the podium and say, I want that guy. I want that guy to represent us both on and off the field. 
But you know, the NFL isn't the only organization out there that has a preferred list of qualities. If you want to be an astronaut, for instance, uh, NASA is going to look at your level of education, your mental endurance, your adaptability. If you want to join the CIA and be an operative, they want courage and confidence and integrity. Every organization on the planet has a list of qualities, and they believe that if the people that are part of our organization have these qualities, we will accomplish our goal, we'll hit our, our vision, our shareholders will make money, whatever it is, if we can just have the people that have these preferred qualities for our team. But the truth is, is that organizations are not the only a group of people that do this. We do this. Think about this. There's qualities that you look for in a friend. Maybe that they're loyal, they're not judgmental, or they have similar interests, or they're fun. For a boss, you're like, I want somebody who's encouraging and supportive, or maybe they challenge you and bring out the best in you. For a spouse, there's definitely a preferred list of qualities, right? That they have empathy, that they're kind, that they love the Lord, that they have similar goals and dreams as I have. We all are looking for a preferred list of qualities in the people that we let into our life. And I believe that the kingdom of God has a preferred list of qualities that it looks for too in the people that it trusts with doing the work of building that kingdom. Now, disclaimer here before I get into this, I don't believe that our qualities give us any more access to the love of God, nor do our qualities give us more or access or a leg up on receiving the grace and mercy that comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is only something that Jesus does for us, in fact, in spite of the many negative qualities that we have as sinners. But if you look at scripture, it seems that God at certain times, in certain places, is looking for certain people with certain qualities to accomplish certain things. It's Noah and his obedience. It's Abraham and his faith. It's David and his heart for God. It's Paul and his fevered passion and so many more. And I don't know about you, as a follower of Jesus, Man, I want to be given assignments. I want God to use my life so that when I get to the end of it, I can look back and say, man, my life was something more than just making a buck and getting through life and paying our taxes and dying. I want to be able to stand before God one day and hear him say, well done, done good and faithful servant. So the question I sometimes have is, what qualities in me need to be brought out? What's going to make me ready to receive a role and an assignment in the building of the kingdom? And so today we're going to be looking at, actually, um, in um, Philippians 2, verses 19 through 30. And in that, we're going to be looking at the qualities of a servant, the preferred qualities of a servant. We're going to look for how can we prepare to walk out those qualities in our life, and last, how do we respond to those that God has given assignments to in our life? How are we to respond appropriately to them as believers? But before we get to Philippians 2.19, uh, it's important to have a little bit of context, I think, to truly understand what Paul is trying to accomplish here. And so we're going to rewind a little bit and review some of the stuff we talked about last week. At the beginning of Philippians 2, Paul lays out this amazing concept and idea to the Philippian church. Humility that creates unity. And as we walk out this humility, it gives us the ability to get along. And Pastor Neil did an amazing job talking about this last week. So that's verses 1 through 4. In verse 5, Paul holds up the ultimate example in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is worthy of all glory and honor and majesty and praise, was willing to set that aside to become a servant and as a servant, he was willing to be obedient and obedient unto death and death on a cross. It is a beautiful text, one of the most beautiful texts in the New Testament that shows us the heart of Jesus and what his mission and vision was. And so Paul holds up this amazing example, and, and I'm sure the Philippians would say, yes, if Jesus can do that, if Jesus can set all that aside, I can certainly set aside my deal. But I have a question for you today. How many of you have ever actually been demotivated by an example that's held up in front of you? In other words, somebody's trying to teach you something, somebody's trying to get you to do something or learn a skill, and they hold up this like amazing example, like the perfect example of what you're supposed to emulate. And even though that should inspire you, there may be a little part of you 
that becomes demotivated, that actually makes me think, should I even try? For you introverts, are there any of you, oh, you just all looked away. <laughs> and you're all in the back anyway, so I can't see you. <laughs> introverts out there, do you have an extroverted friend who when you're talking about social situations or meeting new people, they're just like, hey, just go out there. Just start shaking hands and meet people, it's gonna be great. And you're like, that's great for you. I'm not like you. Or how many of you have read a uh, blog post or watched a YouTube video that'll say something like this, 10 ways to live your life like Mother Teresa, or six things you can do to be as productive as Elon Musk, or two things that you have to do to live a life like Billy Graham. I mean, I read these things and I'm like, I am so inspired by what these people do. It's awesome, but sometimes these people can feel almost like not human. They're so amazing. And there's a part of me that says, I don't know if I can ever do what they've done. And as I read this text today, I almost sense Paul, who's held up the perfect example of humility, perhaps sensing that the people in the Philippian church were perhaps saying, Paul, that's amazing, but I'm not Jesus. Jesus has some skills and some connections that frankly, I just don't got. I don't have Jesus' game. And there could have been some demotivation, but Paul is saying here, when we get to verse 19, you know what? Jesus is the perfect example. L but let me share some other examples of real people, just like you. In fact, in the case of the Philippian church, people you know who are actually emulating the example so beautifully put forward by Jesus. So we meet our first example in uh, verse 19, where it says, Paul saying, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. So the first person Paul is holding up as an example of someone following the example of Jesus is Timothy. You know, Paul, he was in prison, just as a reminder. It was a dark time in his life and he needed some encouragement. And so he taps his number one follower to go and receive a story from the Philippian church that will encourage Paul in his dark time. So who, who is this Timothy? Uh, you may be familiar with him. He's got a couple books in here. Timothy was a young man uh, from the city of Lystra. In fact, Paul met him on his second missionary journey. He was the child of one of his very first converts in the city of Lystra. And we find out in Acts 16, where we're introduced to Timothy, that his reputation preceded himself. In 16.2, it says, speaking of Timothy, that he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul meets this young man, I'm assuming is also impressed with him and invites him to come with him on his missionary journey. And they develop an amazing relationship. Timothy's like a spiritual son to Paul. Paul trusts him implicitly. And so Paul, in this text, has given him the task, the important task. Well, why was, why was Timothy picked for this job? And we actually find that out in verse 20, where it says about Timothy, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Genuinely concerned. Now, that may not seem like much. I mean, we're concerned about everything right now. We're concerned about gas prices. We're concerned about how our kids are doing in school. We're concerned about the war in Ukraine. We're concerned about polar bears or whatever it might be. There's a lot of stuff that we are concerned about. But Paul seems to differentiate a casual concern and a genuine concern. And he shows us that in verse 21, where it says, for they, they being other Christians that Paul could have given this assignment to, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ has interests. These other Christians, they're not seeking after Jesus' interests, they're seeking after their own deal, their own position, their own applause, their own thank you. Timothy, his heart, is after what Jesus is after. So what are the interests of Jesus? And that's actually alluded to a little earlier in the chapter, in chapter two, verse eight, where it says about Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Why was Jesus willing to be obedient unto death and death on a cross? It's because Jesus was in the business of reconciliation. 
See, through sin, the creation had been separated from the creator, and Jesus came to pay the price of that sin so that the creation could once again have access to the Father. And in doing that, Christ establishes the church on the earth, the, the physical presence of Christ on the earth after he leaves, and Christ is in the business of building up that church, and through that church, reaching out with the good news of his death and resurrection to reconcile the world to himself. So the interest of Jesus in the, is in the building up of the church. Well, what's the church? The church isn't a building. The church isn't an institution. The church is a community of people that Christ has died to establish. So Timothy's genuine concern is a selfless concern. He was willing to set aside his own deal to show concern for the building up of the church and the people that, that Jesus died in order to save. For our, so our first preferred quality of a servant is selfless concern. Concern that is beyond our own thing and concern about what Jesus is concerned about. And we'll spend a little time talking about how to bring that out more in our life as we prepare for assignment in the kingdom. But before we do that, let's meet our second example of just a real life, everyday person who's following Jesus' example of humility in beautiful ways. And it's found in verse 25, where Paul says, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. Now, historically, we don't actually know a lot about Epaphroditus, but we can tell from this scripture that he was near and dear to Paul's heart. Epaphroditus is referred to as Paul's brother, which meant there was an intimacy and a closeness. He was referred to as a fellow worker, which means Paul and Epaphroditus were pulling in the same direction at the same time for the same reason. He was a fellow soldier, which means they were in camaraderie with one another. They were willing to aggressively take territory for God together. And he was the minister to Paul's needs sent by the Philippians. Why was Paul in need? He was in prison. And unlike prisons today, when you were in prison in the ancient world, you weren't provided stuff. Yes, you were in prison. You couldn't work, but you were still responsible for taking care of your own food and your own uh, clothing. And so Epaphroditus, knowing the needs of Paul, is sent by the Philippian church to meet those needs as a minister of help. And he brings a gift, and he's meant to stay with Paul for a season to help him and support him. But something has gone wrong. You see, during either his journey to Rome or once he got to Rome, Epaphroditus has become desperately ill. And Paul talks about this actually in verse 27, where he says, Indeed, speaking of Epaphroditus, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So Epaphroditus, in the face of an illness that could have brought death, was willing to finish his act of service to Paul. Epaphroditus illustrates our second kingdom quality, and that is sacrificial service. Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself in obedience to the point of death and death on a cross. Epaphroditus was also willing to sacrifice himself in obedience. Only God, in this case, intervened to heal him. Epaphroditus exhibits sacrificial service, and we see this in verse 30, or 29 and 30, where Paul says, So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor, such men, and here's verse 30, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Epaphroditus didn't play it safe. Epaphroditus didn't say, Hey, Paul, I know you have needs. I know there's stuff you need, but I kind of got my own thing going on right now. He could have sent him a letter and says, Paul, I know that the Philippians gave me these resources to give to you, but my life's a little bit out of balance right now. I just need to focus on my health right now. He didn't do that. He went straight through the obstacle to complete the mission that he was given, sacrificially serving. What does it mean to sacrificially serve? It means we have to give something up. It's easy to serve when it's easy. When we got nothing better to do, and somebody says, can you help me do something? You're like, well, well, better to have something to do, I guess. Sure, I'll come help. Sacrificial service means we give up our thing with the purpose of serving another person or serving in the kingdom. So we are called to walk out 
sacrificial service. So we see two real life examples of people just following this beautiful humility that Jesus talks about, uh, Jesus uh, illustrated at the beginning of chapter two. Timothy and his selfless concern, Epaphroditus and his sacrificial service. So the question is, as believers in Christ, those who want more assignment, more work to build the kingdom, how do we prepare? How do we prepare to develop these preferred qualities in our own life so that God can trust us with the important work of the kingdom? The first thing we must do is self-evaluation, which is the worst kind of evaluation. <laughs> Self-evaluation. Self-evaluation means we have to be willing to ask and honestly answer some really hard questions about ourselves, our inner self. Questions like, why do you do what you do? What are you getting out of the decisions that you're making? Are you doing something because of genuine concern or, or selfless sacrifice, or are you doing something to get a pat on the back, to get an attaboy, to get a like on Facebook or Instagram? Why are you doing what you're doing? When you make decisions, whose priorities do you typically prioritize? Yours? Or the people that are around you? These are hard questions to ask. But when we're willing to ask those questions, what it does is it takes our heart and moves it into alignment with the interests of Jesus. We have to be willing to do a self-evaluation. The second thing that we need to be willing to do is we have to be willing to intentionally invest in others. Intentionally invest in others. That means we need to determine what is most precious to us. No, no, what's really most precious to us. You know how you figure that out? You look at what do I spend my time on? What do I think about? What's my priority? And if you can answer those questions, you will find what is most precious to you. And it could be lots of different things, but let's use just a couple of examples. It could be resources and money. I find that's true for a lot of people. When you think about how they spend their time and their energy and their thoughts, that is really what is most important to them. The other big one is time. Man, time is the most precious uh, asset that we have because it's the one thing in life you cannot get more of. You can never add another second to your day. When you determine what is most precious, you then need to say, how can I intentionally invest that thing in someone that is not me? How can I take that resource or that money and invest it in an organization that is doing the work of God around the earth? How can I look around my life and see people who are hurting and struggling and use my resource not just to make my life more comfortable or more easy or to get the coolest gadget, but how can I bless this person and help their life be better? With my time, instead of holding on to our time and just doling it out in little bits to things that we think are going to make us happy, what if we invest that time in others? in our children, in our spouse, in our community, in people that cannot pay us back? How do we invest that in the kingdom, in our church, who we are called to be part of and help it be effective in its mission of reconciling the community to God? How can we intentionally invest in something that is not us? So we prepare by intentionally investing. The third thing we do is that we kill the comfort zone. So we've done a self-evaluation, we've intentionally invested in others, and then we seek to kill the comfort zone. Because the assignments that God wants for us, guess what, are on just the other side of your comfort zone. Because if it's in your comfort zone, it doesn't take faith. Faith is found outside your comfort zone, and so it must be killed. And how do we do that? We intentionally put ourselves in harm's way. That's uplifting, right? I mean, do I mean physically? Do I mean that you're going to have to put your life on the line? Most of us in this room will probably never have to put our life on the line for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'd like to, us to take a moment today to acknowledge the fact that there are millions of believers around the world that are doing that right now. People that, to, to exhibit selfless concern and sacrificial service, are literally putting their life in God's hands. Now, we may not have to do that, so what do we need to put in harm's way? How about our priorities? How about people's perception of us? How about our reputation? Ugh. Are you willing to be known as that guy 
within your sphere of influence. You know what I mean when I say that guy? That guy who's just a little too into the Bible. That guy who's a little bit too into church. That guy who makes me just slightly uncomfortable because he asked me if he could pray, if he could pray for me the other day. Are you willing to be that guy for Jesus? Are you willing to face rejection to say to a person that you know is hurting in the cubicle next to you or the neighbor next door and say, hey, you know what? I notice that things are hard right now. Can I pray for you? Can I serve for you? And you know what? They might say no. But are we willing to risk it for Jesus? Because when we do that, it kills the comfort zone and it gives us and puts us in a position to be able to walk out the calling that God has for us. So we prepare through self-evaluation through intentionally investing in others and killing the comfort zone. But there's something else in this text that I want to bring out today, and it's actually found in verse, uh, uh, verse 29. He's talking about Epaphroditus, and Paul says, So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. See, God has given, let me put it this way, you are someone else's assignment Helping you become who you're meant to be and the disciple that you're meant to become is actually somebody else's assignment. So how are we to respond to people like Timothy and their selfless concern and people like Epaphroditus and their sacrificial service who are in your life or in our church? Paul tells us that we are to respond with all joy and with honor. And what does that look like? I mean, if we use our NFL example, of course, these guys who've gone through all this poking and prodding and training and evaluation, on draft night, they put the hat on, they walk through the tunnel, and everyone's going crazy, and they're greeting them with joy and with honor. I don't think we're going to do a tunnel here, unless you think that's a cool idea. Maybe we could. (laughs) So how can we do it? What does that look like? Because there are so many people that are doing this just here in this church body. It's the nursery worker who right now is rocking your baby or changing their diaper so that you can be in this service. It's the small group leader who's willing to open their home and plan a lesson so that you can grow as a disciple. It's the volunteer who's foregoing a cup of coffee out on the patio on an early Saturday morning and they're driving across town to hand out diapers and hygiene items to refugees. It's the elder who on three Tuesdays a month is in this building from 5.30 to 9 o'clock praying for you and helping to encourage our church so it is effective as possible. It's the minister that perhaps has stepped away from a lucrative career and a nice house and car to serve the church. It's a missionary who has said goodbye to friends and family and comfort and they're going across the ocean to people who have never heard about Jesus. It's the door holder, it's the grass cutter, it's the handshaker, and it's the coffee maker. It's the conversation haver, it's the prayer warrior, it's the middle school leader, and it's the gym floor sweeper. It is the hundreds of people that are out there with selfless concern and sacrificial service to help our church be effective and help you become the person that you're meant to become. So how are we to respond to them? Joy and honor. I mean, what does that look like? Here's just some super practical examples. You can come up with probably some amazing examples yourself. How about like an old school thank you card? Thank you for what you're doing. I appreciate it. How about if you're a small group, you could adopt a missionary and say, man, it's hard to be overseas away from your family. A couple times a year, let's hop on a Zoom call with them, hear what they're doing, and pray for them and encourage them. It's looking around the people that are sowing into your children's life and saying, how can I help lift the load? It's praying for these people who are in your life. And not just praying for them, but take the extra step of shooting them an email or a text or a smoke signal or talk to them, whatever it is, and let them know you are being prayed for. You are being supportive. I've got your back. Man, these are ways that we can welcome people with joy and honor them. All of this, selfless concern, sacrificial service, the example of Jesus reminds me of a story I recently heard. Uh, Some of you who've been around the Christian world for a while might know the name Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell uh, uh, has been around for a long time. He's been a very successful preacher and teacher of the word. Last I heard, he's done like 25,000 talks at 118 universities around the world. Um, He started out with an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ, which is now Crew. And when he got a seminary and he joined Crew, his one dream was to preach 
and to teach. Oh, it's what he wanted to do. He was so excited that God was going to use him in this powerful way. But for the first three years of his time with crew, he didn't get to do that one time. In fact, you know what he did? He did things like making sandwiches for the people that were going to be going out to do beach evangelism on the coast. He got the unenviable task of of, uh, working with the volunteers at an event to make sure everything was going okay. He wasn't the guy on stage getting all the applause and the joy and the honor. And so one day, he finally got tapped on the shoulder. It was going to be his chance. His chance to teach. And he was so excited about it, he spent days preparing And the day before he was supposed to speak at this event, he gets a call from Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade. And Bill says to him, Josh, listen, we have an emergency. Our staff member can't come down there. We need you to go down there and run the grounds crew at this event. And Josh is like, no, 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 I'm supposed to be teaching this weekend. And Bill's like, listen, we'll get you on another time. Don't worry about it. But we need you to come down and do this. So Josh goes down, and he's in charge of 120 college-age volunteers, and his job that weekend is to make sure the garbages were taken out, the the floors were clean, and to scrub the toilets. In fact, he got nicknamed that weekend Colonel Commode because of the work that he was doing. Not glamorous work. And Josh tells the story that uh, there was a guy near the end of the conference who had walked through the parking lot, and they had just done some, like, refinishing, so he had tar all over his feet, And he walked on this carpet at this event and it put these like tar footprints all up the thing. And Bill Bright sees it. He's like, Josh, you got to clean this up because Billy Graham is coming to speak at the event tonight. It's got to look perfect for him. And so Josh has this bottle of cleaning solution and a brush and he's just like doing it, scrubbing it. He's getting madder and madder and madder. God, when are you going to put me in my position? Give me my assignment that I meant, that I was meant to walk out. And he gets so frustrated, he takes this bottle of cleaning solution and he goes up to a countertop and there's a couple people standing there and he slams it down on the countertop and the liquid shoots all over the place, all over him and all over the people that are standing there. And Josh says, when that happened, the moment it hit that countertop, it's like Jesus spoke into my heart and said, Josh, I was willing to wash these people's feet and die for them. Don't you think that you would clean a toilet? And it broke something in him. He recognized the fact that, man, I don't have the qualities of a servant. I don't have the attitude of a servant. I'm not living out selfless concern. I'm not sacrificially serving. I'm in it for what's in it for me. And Josh, from that point on, became a serving maniac. He was everywhere trying to serve people as best he can. And shortly after that, he finally got that chance to teach and got that chance to preach. And he became Crew's number one speaker all around the world. And at that point, he was welcomed with joy and he was honored. But it took some preparation. It took him becoming a servant and walking out the humility of Jesus so that he could be trusted with the important assignment and work of the kingdom. So my prayer for us today is that we can be willing to prepare, to go through that preparation process which can sometimes hurt, but to adopt these preferred kingdom qualities so God can give us our assignment to accomplish for the kingdom. And then as we prepare, we can turn around and with joy and honor, welcome those that God has given assignments to in our life to help us become who we're meant to become.